ending well. Because only they that endure unto the end shall be saved. And so there's no contradiction. We're not talking about the evidential proof of salvation, saving faith in Christ. In James chapter 2, reading from verse 14, what does it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he has faith, watch of mouth. Just, I have faith, I have faith, and have not works, have not the evidence. Can that faith save him? Look at verse 15. In verse 15, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, verse 16, and one of you say unto them, depart in peace. Be ye warm and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What does that profit? In verse 17 it says, even so, faith, if it has not works, if it has no fruit, if it has no evidence, if you are not walking in by that faith, expressing, <clears throat> expressing your faith in a definite, practical, profitable way, it says that faith is dead being alone. Dead being alone. Then in verse 18, verse 18 tells us, yea, yes, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have, and I have words. Show me thy faith without thy words, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Verse 19, in verse 19, thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. But look at this, the devils also believe and tremble. The devils also believe that the day of judgment is coming and they tremble. The devils also believe that a day of reckoning is coming and they tremble. The devil also believe the nature of God, that God is holy that God is just and that God is impartial and the devils tremble. But if you say you have faith, you do not tremble at the law you are broken. You do not tremble at the evil life you live. You do not tremble at the emptiness of your life. The devils are even better than you are and God is a just God cannot condemn those devils and then make you go free. We're talking about faith that has proof, faith that has expression, faith that has evidence of that salvation that we have in Christ. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, we're looking at the deadness of empty faith without evident fruit, the deadness of empty faith. I believe, I believe, I believe. Where is the fruit? Where is the evidence, the deadness of empty faith without evident fruit? Number two, the deceptiveness. You deceive yourself. You deceive the preachers. You deceive the community. You deceive everyone, but the one that is more serious is yourself. You deceive yourself that you are going to heaven, whereas you are the broad way that goes, that leads to hell. The deceptiveness of external fruit without essential faith. Fruit. External fruit without essential faith. You have not been planted in the kingdom by faith. It's just like, you know, like those seeds we learned in biology that, you know, the wind just scatters them and they begin to bear some kind of fruit, but there's no root. 
and there are people like that. They do not have essential faith that plants us in the kingdom of God. They deceive themselves by those external fruit, the deceptiveness of external fruit without essential faith. Number three, the demand is demand of explicit faith with the expected fruit. We're coming to number one. Number one, we're looking at the deadness of empty faith without evident fruit. Three things we're looking at there. Number one, there's no saving faith without spiritual fruit. No saving faith without spiritual fruit. Anybody can give any testimony. Anybody can shout and say, I have faith, but it is not saving faith if it does not have spiritual fruit. Number two, no sanctifying faith without scriptural fruit. Sanctification is not a word of mouth. Sanctification is not a doctrine in the book. There are churches like ours that have sanctification in their tenets of faith. They have it in the book. They have it in their song. Holiness unto the Lord. Shout it loud and long. It's in the book. But it must come to the heart. There's no sanctifying faith without scriptural fruit. Number three, no steadfast faith without steady fruit. Steady fruit. The fruit that abides and the fruit that is there all the time. Knock the man. The fruit of salvation will be evident. Push the man, the fruit of salvation will be evident. Make him to, you know, put your leg and make him to stumble, but the evidence of salvation will be there. Slap him on the one cheek, the evidence of salvation will be there. Compel him to go, the, the first smile, the evidence of salvation will be there. Take something from him, his clothes, his honor, and his self-esteem. Take anything from him, the evidence of salvation will be there. Interact with him and you will see the evidence of salvation if there's no steadfast if there is no steadfast faith then there's no steady fruit if there's no steady fruit then there is no steadfast faith we're looking at number one number one we're looking at no saving faith without spiritual fruit it tells us in titus chapter one verse 16 it says they profess that they know god but in words they deny him you can see contradiction in their lives they profess that they believe in god they profess that they know god they profess their children of god but in words they deny him being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. They profess that they know God. They're religious, traditionally religious. <clears throat> they're religious, they're denominationally religious, and they are active religiously, but in words, they deny him. Their lives contradict the faith they profess. They profess no, self, no saving faith without spiritual fruit. It tells us in John chapter 2. John chapter 2, reading from verse 23. Now, when he, Christ, was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the, in the feast, in the feast day, many believed on his name. They said they believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. Look at verse 24. In verse 24, but Jesus did not commit himself unto them. 
Jesus, the one that knows every heart, every life, and the one that knows the root of the expressions of our lives, the one that knows the reason behind every action, he did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men, verse 25, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. The depravity was still in them, and they said, I believe, I believe. The deception was still in them, I believe, I believe. And the defilement was still in their lives, in their private. And yet they said, I believe, I believe. And Jesus said, he will not commit himself unto them because they did not have the spiritual fruits to back up what he claimed as saving faith. Uh, we're looking at number two now. Number two, we're looking at no sanctifying faith. Without, if I, yes, but I easily get annoyed. There's no sanctification there. Wait until something rubs them the other way, the other direction. There's something they don't like. And then they come out, and you will see they have an attitude of fighting, an attitude of wanting to, you know, blow you down and kick you up. I thought you said you were sanctified. Yes, but I easily get annoyed. There's no sanctification there. And wait until something is being divided between him and her. And he wants to take the lion's share. And then his struggle begins. I thought you said you were sanctified. Yes, but I don't like anybody cheating me. Sanctification must have a scriptural fruit. It tells us in Acts chapter 26, reading from verse 18, Acts 26, verse 18, to open their eyes. If I'm sanctified, my eyes will be open, spiritual eyes, and to turn them from darkness to light. Your life will be in the light. Something is being divided between him and her. And he wants to take the lion's share. And then his struggle begins. I thought you said you were sanctified. Yes, but I don't like anybody cheating me. Sanctification must have a scriptural fruit. It tells us in Acts chapter 26, reading from verse 18, Acts 26, verse 18, to open their eyes. If I'm sanctified, my eyes will be open, spiritual eyes, and to turn them from darkness to light. Your life will be in the light. There will be nothing covered. There will be nothing secret. Everything will be open because you have been turned from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. When we are saved and when we are sanctified, our lives are free from the control of Satan. My friend, I've been watching you. Once something annoys you, I can tell. Oh, you see, you, I understand what you are telling me. But you know, it's not me. It's the devil. If you are saved, the devil will not be in control of your life. If you are sanctified, the devil will not be in control of your temper. Because sanctification, the sanctification that comes from God and we receive by faith, clears all doses away. And we're turned from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins, that salvation and inheritance among them which are sanctified, among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me that is in christ it tells us in galatians chapter 2 verse 20 galatians chapter 2 we're reading from verse 20 it says i am crucified with christ 
that, that's the evidence, the evidence that we know God, the evidence that we are attached to God, the evidence that we are, we are identified with Christ. I, the me on the inside, the old man in me, the one that is they get angry, the one that is easily annoyed, the one that looks like the world, and the one that gives a kiss it like Adam, it says the I within me, I am crucified. Tell me you're sanctified. How about the Adamic nation? Has that been crucified? Tell me you are sanctified. I about that man on the inside that's always, always thinking of evil, always imagining evil, always dreaming of evil. Tell me, if you are sanctified, I, the one within, is crucified. The one that secretly likes pornography. And he's, uh, you know, and you know it, but... How do I know you know? When somebody you respect, who is not like you, who doesn't like pornography like you do, when it's coming, you close it up. Where is the crucifixion? I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You are conscious of all, all that, everything. The price he prayed, he paid. The sacrifice he made. And the blood he shed for your salvation, for your sanctification. And you are forever grateful. In attitude, you are grateful. In action, you are grateful. Anything you do, you are grateful. And you are always remembering, he died for me. He gave himself for me. How grateful I am that he did all that for me. And that affects your life. You think before you act. How will they show gratitude to the Lord? How will they show people, righteous people, holy people? I know in that path, the Lord wants me to go through. There is a kind of belittling and looking down reproach. Because you are a saved, sanctified soul. If you are sanctified, you will go through it. Because it says, let us go forth, therefore unto him, bearing his reproach. But if you're always running from, I don't like their attitude, I don't like what they do, I don't like what I might go through, I might come to some reproach, I might come to some, you know, the deal push me down, and it'll push me away. And even though I know that the path that Lord wants me to go through, I don't want to do that because of the reproach. There's no sanctification there. When there's sanctification, you identify with Christ. In persecution, in reproach, in everything. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. In verse 14, it says, For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. The people who are only for the world, only for the earth, they are running away from the challenges of life. They cannot come out and express the goodness and the grace of God, the salvation, the sanctification of the Lord. The only thing here about the, about the people who know that here we don't have any continuing city and we're seeking one to come, they're free. They come out. They do what the Lord wants them to do, reproach or no reproach, insult or assault, whatever, because that depravity within has been taken away. And whatever they meet, the reproach and the insult and the assault, there's no anger. And there is, a, and there is a no fighting because they know whose nature they now have. But looking at number three here, number three is a steadfast faith without no steadfast faith without steady fruit. 
if you cannot bear fruit steadily, if you on, if you're only on the mountain top, when if everybody is praising you and appreciating you, and then when they look away from you because they cannot be looking at you all the time, they have their own lives to live. And they have, they have their own journey to traverse. And they have their own goal to pursue. And once they're not looking at you and you're not at the limelight, then you do not have the fruit you used to have. When we have steadfast faith, when we have the faith that will take us to the end of our journey, and we're steadfast about that, there will be steady fruit, steady fruit all along. It tells us in First Peter chapter 5, reading from verse 9. In verse 9 it says, A whom resisted fast in the faith, the devil will come, trials will come, temptation will come, difficulties, challenges will come, but you stand and you are steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same affliction are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. We stand steadfast. That's faith. That's faith. It's not just, I believe, I believe. Yes, you believe at the entrance of the kingdom. And then you're moving on. As you're moving on, you have to have that steadfast faith. You're climbing the hill. The hill may be tall. The hill may almost get you out of breath because of the slope. But you are steadfast. One step more. One day more. One activity more. One victory more. Steadfast. Steadfast. All that longer moving in the Lord. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. And we're reading here from verse 14. It says, For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. That's not talking about the faith by which you enter. You're not walking on the narrow way, on the highway of holiness. And you're walking in a steadfast way. You're moving on, and you're not diverted here, diverted there. You don't take another by road where things might be easier. But it says we're made partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast, unto the end that nothing shifts you but the people that do not have the steadfast faith have you seen them they came out of egypt hilarious happy and joyful they came out with many things that were given to them by those egyptians how happy they were and then they went through the red sea and when they went through the red sea and they saw the egyptians floating on the sea, they shouted, glorious is God, holy is our God. How happy they were. But when there was a little thirst and the water was bitter and they couldn't drink, they started murmuring, you can tell. They didn't have steadfast faith in the Lord. They walked by sight. What are we going to drink? What are we going to eat? How is this going to happen? How is that going to happen? They didn't have steadfast faith. You see them happy and joyful. When they come to know the Lord, they have the faith to enter. But now the faith to express their happiness and joy in God as they continue the narrow way. There's no husband yet. And then their faith will begin to shake. There's no wife yet. Their faith will begin to shake. And there is no child after marriage. Their faith will begin to shake. But you know, Abraham was told that he was steadfast in faith. Even though his body was telling him, how could you have a child now? But he knew he was fully persuaded that what God has promised, 
is able to do that the steadfast faith. The Lord wants us to be steadfast. So we're not undulating. We're not vacillating. We're not up and down, down and up. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 18. Hebrews chapter 3, we're looking at verse 18. And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest. They came out, came into the kingdom, but now during in the way, the faith that makes us to stand and stay in the way, they didn't have that. And so they could not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not. They believed at the beginning, but the faith did not continue. In verse 19, in verse 19, so we we'll see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. They could not enter in because of unbelief. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 17. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 17. Ye therefore, beloved, see, ye know these things before, beware lest ye also be led away by the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. Watch it, watch it all the time. Whatever the people do, do not fall from your own steadfastness. Whatever the people accept or reject, do not fall from your own steadfastness. Whatever other people declare or demonstrate, that's them, that's them. Do not fall from your own steadfastness. Whatever lies anybody may preach, whatever life anyone may live, that's them. Make sure that you remember how you came into the kingdom by faith, personal faith in the Lord. You didn't believe like in, like with corporate faith. You didn't believe like with family faith, personal faith. You came into the kingdom. There were people that had the same message you heard at the time you believed the same message, but they did not believe. They did not any time. You made your choice and you said, I am going to enter into the kingdom. I repent and I believe. And that's, that's how you enter. Now, the error of the wicked, some backslide, some scorn, some scoff, whatever they do, do not allow the wickedness of the people, anyone, to make you fall from your own steadfastness. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, but grow in grace. Do you know we grow in grace? Do you know we grow in faith? Do you know we grow in love? Do you know we grow in consecration? Do you know we grow even in our steadfastness? Do you know we grow in our absolute surrender unto the Lord? Grow. Because if you don't grow, you will retrogress. You'll go back. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Both now and forever. In your life now, in your life forever. Amen. We're coming. faith. We're looking at James chapter 2 and we're reading from verse 17. James chapter 2 verse 17. Even so faith if it has not works, if it has no expression, if it, if it has no fruit, is dead being alone. That's dead faith that does not have fruit, that does not have expression, that does not have accompanying work, 
that's what we talk about the deceptiveness of external fruit without essential faith look at verse 18 in verse 18 yea a man may say thou hast faith and i have works there are people that choose whatever they want okay there's faith i choose faith there's works you choose works okay there is holiness you choose holiness there is liberty i choose liberty there are people that divide the provisions of the word of god and whatever their flesh cannot endure i don't choose that whatever will build up their flesh accept their lust accept their weakness accept and pamper them pitch them and always encourage them even when they are sinning that's what they want i like encouragement i choose encouragement choose the whole word of god everything he has given us man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of god shall man live thou hast, thou hast faith i have worked show me thy faith without thy works and i will show thee my faith by my works we're looking at three things here number one number one we're looking at the supernatural fruit superficial fruit on the surface appears like fruit you know sometimes you see uh, some of these uh, wax uh, fruit like pineapple and it looks like real but is superficial a bite will disappoint you there are people that have a fruit like that looks like fruit but when they open their mouth to talk you can see it's superficial they don't have the real fruit and when they you know when something comes across them then you can see it's wax it's superficial it's not real there is superficial fruit without faith in the Savior. Number two is the spectacular fruit without the fruit of the Spirit. Spectacular fruit, that is, they can work miracles. They can cast out devils in the name of Jesus. The, the devil doesn't know their life. The devil just hears the name of Jesus and the devil is for their life. They do not have the fruit of the spirit. Number three is simulated fruit without the foundation of the surrender, the art to manifest. Look at number one. Number one, we're looking at the superficial fruit without faith in the Savior. It tells us in Hosea chapter 10, reading from verse 1. Hosea chapter 10, verse 1. Israel is an empty vine. Empty vine. Empty bag that cannot stand upright because it's empty. There's nothing inside. Empty life that cannot do right because it's empty. Empty of the grace of God empty of the love of God, empty of devotion unto God. Israel is an empty vine. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself. Do you know people like that, whatever they think they're doing, and they say they're doing it for God, really they're doing it for themselves. They're doing it for people to appreciate them. They're doing it for people to see their gifts. And uh, if you don't uh, give appreciation to that gift, then they misuse the gift. They distort the gift because you're not giving them the honor, the glory they want. 
approach is unto themselves. But you know, when we're, when we're bearing fruit unto God, it doesn't matter what people say, what people say, what people do. We give that gift unto the Lord with everything we have got. We say, the Lord will like this. The Lord will appreciate this. Our mind is on God, not on ourselves. Our mind is on God, not on people that can either praise us or blame us. But Israel, Israel is an empty vine. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself according to the multitude of his fruit. He has increased the altars according to the goodness of his land. They have made goodly images. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, it says, Now their heart is divided. Their heart is divided. They are not staying on God. They are not focusing on God. They are not relying on God. They are not walking. They are not living for the glory of God alone. They are looking for another thing. It says their heart is divided. Now shall they be found faulty. When your heart is divided, when you are not totally leaning on the Lord, when you are not totally serving the Lord, but you have another thing in focus, it says you will be found faulty. It shall break down their altars. He shall spoil their images. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, now it says, So to yourselves, in righteousness. If you're going to serve the Lord, if you're going to be steadfast with the Lord, if you're not going to remain superficial, sort yourselves in righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and reign righteousness upon you and hey, look at matthew chapter 23 the people that have superficial fruit without faith in the savior it's not faith in the savior producing what they're doing is self-effort is commitment to religion is commitment to the things that the same people will appreciate and it'll go any lane to have the praise of men, superficial fruit, without faith in the Savior. Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay the tithe of mint and anise, and cumin, and have committed, have omitted the weightier matters of the law. The weightier matters of the law, that one they omitted. Justice or judgment, mercy, faith. These ought ye to have done. That he is giving of tithes, ye should have done that. That's all right. But you shouldn't have left the other undone. Everything you do in action, in life, in expression of what you believe must be coming from the heart of faith. Look at verse 25. In verse 25, it says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye make clean the outside of the cup meticulous the outside of the club of the cup what people will see what people will know they're meticulous in keeping that right in keeping that clean and it says you do that for the platter but within they are full of extortion and excess okay they know people will not see this their hearts have not been cleansed their hearts have not been emptied of evil things, of 
defilement. Look at verse 28. In verse 28, it says, Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men. Righteous unto men. That is, unto men who are not living with them. The people who are living with them, they can tell. They can tell of their temper. They can tell of their anger. They can tell of evil action. Those who are living with them. But those who don't know them, they appear righteous unto men. Uh, the people who look at only the outward expression. Thank you, sir. If that's only what you're looking at. Thank you, madam. And then you bend. <laughs> if that's all you're looking for. And you don't know the heart. They appear righteous outwardly unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Of hypocrisy and iniquity. Why don't you check up your heart? Check up on your life. We have heard enough. We know about salvation. And we know if any man be Christ is a new creature. How new are you? The new creature in the new covenant. We know that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. Do you ever think of entering the kingdom of God? Or do you just act like a Pharisee? Or do you just live like a Pharisee? When last did you ask for grace to do what you need to do beyond your human strength? When last did you pray that God will give you the power to subdue the flesh and subdue the depravity that is trying to raise his ugly head from your life? Are you not just satisfied with the outward dressing, outward appearance, outward uh, similarity to the saints of God? Is that enough? That superficial fruit without faith in the Savior. And we're looking at Isaiah chapter 58, and we're reading from the Chapter 58, verse 1. Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sin. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, yet they seek me daily. Do you know the people that go to church daily? There are. Do you know the people that go to prayer meeting daily in their church? There are. Do you know the people that study the Bible every day? I mean, in the church congregation, there are. And yet it says, they seek me daily and delight to know my ways. They like to have the word preach unto them. They delight to know my ways. And it says, as a nation that did righteousness, as if they did righteousness, and forsook not the ordinance of their God, they ask of me the ordinance of justice. They take delights in approaching to God. Are they righteous because of that? No. If you read the following verses, it shows that they did not really know God. They didn't delight in the word that will make them turn, make them repent, make them seek the Lord. They were superficial worshippers. They didn't have faith, real faith in God. In Revelation chapter 2, we're reading from verse 4. It says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. You know, these are people 
the angel to the church in Ephesus, the members of the church, the minister of the church in Ephesus, they loved doctrine. And they're very vigilant on doctrine. If anybody comes and does not bring that doctrine, they can spot it out immediately. And you can say that's false doctrine, that's wrong doctrine, that's not scriptural doctrine. We're honestly contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints. That's good, but nevertheless, have somewhat against them. Because thou hast led thy first love. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, it says, Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. The one that has dropped the first love is falling. The one that has dropped the original consecration is falling. The one that is not looking at circumstances before they can manifest their love to Christ is falling. The one that is, you know, when he's not happy, is not holy. Their happiness must come first. If there's no happiness, there's no holiness, they are not holy unto the Lord because after all, I'm not happy. Why should I be holy? Those people, they blend their false consecration and their false commitment. And it says, remember where thou hast fallen. And then it says, repent and do the false works or else I will come unto thee quickly. And will remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. You know, we've heard of that repentance a lot, yet we'll put the repentance in a pigeonhole. Those who are adulterers, they must repent. Those who tell lies, they must repent. And those who are not in our church, they're coming for the first time. And they don't dress like we recommend. They must repent. But the people that lost their first love, their first sensitivity to the voice of the Spirit. How about them? Are they not going to repent? How about the people that are just offering superficial sacrifice and they do not have Deep, deepening faith in Christ. Are they not to repent? Yes, they have to repent. Otherwise, they will come and take the candlestick. I will look at number two here. Number two, we're looking at the spectacular fruits without the fruit spirit. Would you know the people that have spectacular fruits and, and they know and they, they rejoice in that. They think that at the end of the road. They have spectacular, spectacular fruit. Look at Matthew chapter 7, reading from verse 21. Matthew 7, verse 21, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. The people that feel calling Christ Lord, Lord, that's sufficient. They never even make an effort to do the will of the Father who is in heaven. For the will of the Father, our salvation, our redemption, our righteousness, our sanctification, our purity of heart, our life without reproach. Our life free of offense toward God and toward man. That's the will of God. The people that never think about the will of God, all they think about is miracle, healing, deliverance. Look at verse 22. In verse 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works. They're running after signs and wonders. 
And even when the opportunity is there to be saved, to examine our lives, whether we be in the face or not, that one, there's no, there's no concern for that. The concern they have is for prophecy, is for mighty words, is for casting out devils. Verse 23. In verse 23, then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Doing mighty works, I never knew you. They did not have the fruit that showed that the Holy Spirit is present in their lives. Then when I profess unto them, I never knew you depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Where should your priority be? Your priority should be on having the fruit of the Spirit. Christ is coming, and he will come soon, any time from now. And if all you have is that I got a miracle, not only that, I give miracles to other people. I fast, I pray, I have the gifts of the Spirit, I have the word of knowledge, I have the word of wisdom, and I have faith to move mountains, but your heart does not have that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. At the end, you'll be of all men the most miserable. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, reading from verse 1, Though I speak of the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Verse 2. In verse 2 it says, And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries, and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, and have not charity, the love that works by faith. I am nothing. Look at verse 3. It says in verse 3, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, you know, there are people that are fanatical. And if there is any argument about your church and our church, they can fight. They can say, our pastor is the best in the land. No, we have a pastor you have not heard. A pastor is greater, better, and deeper than your deeper pastor. Then they, can, they remove their coat and are ready to fight. What are they fighting about? They're fighting about opinions. They're fighting about what he says against our people and what he's saying about his people. If you give your body to be burnt, and you are ready to defend your ideology, you are ready to defend your religion, you are ready to defend anything that you appreciate, that other people don't appreciate, if you die in that anger, in that annoyance, you die in that hot, furious temper, there's no heaven there. You see, what's important is the fruit of the Spirit will to have. The love and the joy and the peace and the gentleness and the meekness and the long-suffering and the fidelity, the faith, and the steadfastness, the temperance, the self-control. That's, that's what we need, and that is what shows that we belong to the Lord, but fighting about this and fighting about that and about this other sin, it says, will miss the kingdom of God. We're looking at Matthew chapter 24, and I'm reading from verse 24. Matthew chapter 24, verse 24, and it says, But there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and 
wonders. Don't be deceived. In these last days, there will arise prophets, false prophets, and false Christ that will show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. In verse 25, it says, Behold, I have told you before. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, reading from verse 9, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, even him whose coming is after the walking of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. The signs that deceive, the wonders that deceive, the miracles that deceive lying wonders. In verse 10, in verse 10 it says, and with all deceivableness of righteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth. They received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. All they are looking for is the sensational that will make them feel excited. Look at that miracle. Look at that miracle. But they do not have the love for the truth that they might be saved. Look at yourself. Have you shifted your ground? Have you shifted from having salvation to having just signs and wonders and miracles? Look at verse 11. In verse 11, it says, And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. There are people, millions of them in the world. Once they see miracle, they don't examine the doctrine the people preach. Once they see healing, deliverance, and once they see some sensational things, that man can pray. And once he prays, look at what happens. They do not look at the false doctrine beneath that miracle. And it says, because of that, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe in lie. In verse 12, verse 12 says that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in righteousness. We're looking at number three here. Number three, the simulated fruit without the foundation of surrender. If we're going to be acceptable to the Lord, there must be absolute surrender unto Him. It will have all or nothing. If you're bargaining, God, I give part of my heart and part of my love and part of my devotion unto you. I have another entity. I have another deity that I want to give the other part of my love, the other part of my consecration, the other part of my devotion. It says he will not share his glory with any other deity, with any other man. He will not share the submission you have with any other. He will not even share it with you. If you want to keep part of the surrender, part of the submission, part of the consecration, part of your love for yourself, it's not going to accept your self-love for the love of God. Simulated fruit without the foundation of surrender. And we're looking at Luke chapter 16. And I'm reading from verse 13. Luke chapter 16 verse 13 it says no servant can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he or else he will hold to the one and he will despise the other ye cannot serve God and mammon we must make a choice. 
if we're going to love God, love him with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. He wants total, absolute surrender. And he wants that before any other thing you offer unto him. What if a wife in the home will say, my husband, this is just who I am. I'll cook your food. I'll take care of the house. I'll be a great, a good homemaker. Only one thing I cannot give you. I cannot submit or surrender on that one I hold. And nothing can take that away from me. Yes, I know I'm married, but surrender, submission, never. But I cook your food, I wash your clothes, I do everything, only that. What kind of marriage will that be? That kind of wife will make a puppet that she can trample upon you and go anywhere because there's no surrender. The same thing, that's the way people are treating God. They say, God, I read your book, I read the Bible, I'll serve you, I'll worship, I'll do everything, but my worship will be devoid of surrender and submission. What do you think God thinks about that? He doesn't want those simulated fruits without absolute surrender unto him. That's why it says no man can serve God and mammon. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, and the Pharisees also who are covetous heard all these things and they derided him. He preached well, they derided him. He preached the truth, they derided him. He spoke words of life eternal, they derided him. They looked down on him, they disrespected him. Why? He was telling the truth, but the truth came to near their door. And because the truth came so much near them, that's why they derided them. And in verse 15, verse 15 says, and he said unto them, and you know, it's good to have Christ as a model, as an example, as a perfect pattern that he will not shrink back because they derided him. His mouth will not be muscled because they derided him. He will not stop telling the truth, the burning truth in the hearts of men because they derided him. And so he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. And that's what we need to understand, that uh, if we're serving the Lord, there's no pretense, there's no cover up, there's no spirit, there's no uh, kind of superficiality. And we're looking at Romans chapter 10, reading from verse 3. Romans chapter 10, we're reading from verse 3. It says, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not, have not, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God simulated fruit without the foundation of surrender. We're coming to point number three. Point number three, we're looking at we're looking at the demand for explicit, very clear, 
or shaded, unclouded faith with expected fruit. The demand of God, the expectation of God, the thing that God is looking for in every heart, every heart that comes to him, that's the demand of explicit faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to leave the awe of the Chaldeans, he led going after what God had said, not knowing whither he went. Faith in action. By faith, Noah, when he was told to build an ark, he moved with fear and faith so that he built the ark for the safety of his family and the people that were here. By faith, Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he walked with God. These were people that had explicit faith, clear faith that you could see and you can tell here in the faith of the true believer. And that's what God demands. He doesn't want a kind of doubtful faith. Is that faith or something similar to faith? He doesn't want a kind of a superficial faith that has no action, that has no demonstration that this is total, complete, absolute faith unto God. The demand for explicit faith with the expected fruit. In James chapter 2, we're reading from verse 18. James chapter 2, reading from verse 18. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. In verse 19, verse 19, thou believest that there is one God that doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. What's the apostle James telling us here? He said, when you see the judgment of God, when you hear of the judgment of God, when you hear that God is a consuming fire, do you tremble? Do you stop what you are doing? Do you turn around? Do you repent? Do you go to God with a sober heart? He said, if you don't, well, the devils tremble when they hear of the coming judgment and when Christ comes and he wants to drive out the legion. They are so afraid, they tremble. They say, don't cast us into the abyss. And then they said, there are swine there, cast us there. And they said, go. You see, they tremble because they know the judgment to come. Do you tremble when you hear of the judgment to come? The axe is laid on the root of the tree. And everyone that comes to God and believes in God must repent and turn away from evil. And we're looking at three things here. Number one, examine your faith in the light of the New Testament. Examine your faith in the light of, look at Abraham, Hebrews chapter 11. Look at Abel. Look at Enoch. Look at Noah. Look at Moses. Look at the Jericho walls, how they fell. Look at the expression of faith and examine your faith in the light of the New Testament. Number two, evaluate your faith. Are you weak and found wanting? Is your faith going to make you ready for the coming of the Lord? Why are you coming to study the word of God and never evaluate what you have? 
whether what you have is enough to enter into the kingdom or not. Evaluate your faith in line with noticeable trembling. Number three, express your faith with a life of noble truthfulness. Look at number one. Number one, examine your faith in the light of the New Testament. We're told in First Corinthians, Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Second Corinthians chapter 13 verse 5 examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith examine yourselves why do you just hear the word of god right so let us pray you stand there and you are waiting for in the in jesus name we pray have you prayed have you examined yourself have you thought of everything you have heard and compared with what you possess, what you have, are you just there? You hear sound. But did you understand the meaning of the sound as it reflects on your life? Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves? how that Jesus Christ is in you except ye be reprobates. He wants us to examine our lives. He wants us to examine if Christ shall come today. Am I ready for the calling of the saints of above we're looking at number two here number two evaluate your face in line with noticeable trembling evaluate that faith evaluate that faith and we're coming to some two and we're reading from verse 11 in some two verse 11 serve the lord of fear I rejoice with trembling and rejoice with trembling this is the inspired word of god do you ever tremble anything will reach do you pass it on to others that's talking about the pharisees that's talking about the Sadducees. That's talking about the disciples before the cross. That's talking about leaders and preachers. And you put everything in different pigeonholes, and you never put anything in your pigeonhole. Where will you spend eternity? Serve the Lord for fear. What kind of fear? Should I all do all this? running up, running down, sweating, climbing, descending, and yet, what if I'm not acceptable to God in the final day? What if my secret deeds are so serious and blameable in the sight of God, and all these outward activities are not going to recommend me to God? That's what he's saying Rejoice with trembling. Verse 12. In verse 12, it says, Kiss the son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. But blessed are all they that put their trust in him. They trust him for salvation and they have real, genuine salvation. They trust God for sanctification and they have real purging, purifying of their heart and life. They trust God for steady faith, steadfast faith, and the Lord keeps them up, kept by the power of the Lord unto that final salvation that shall be revealed. They trust God. 
that the grace of God will be sufficient for them in trial, in tribulation, in persecution, in misunderstanding, in suffering. They trust God that nothing will stop them on this or what journey to heaven. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. We're looking at Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, we're looking at verse 12. It says, Wherefore, my beloved, my brethren, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, walk out your own salvation. This Paul the Apostle, by the Spirit of God, is not even James now, but they tell us that, you know, Paul understood faith. Faith without works. I told you already, is the faith to enter. But now that you are in the way, in the narrow way that leads to heaven, walk out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Then in verse 13, in verse 13, for it is God which walketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Verse 14, do all things without murmurings. Those are the people that have faith. They know that what they are called to do is by God. They know that the work they are doing, that the work of God, and they know it's not man. And whatever man feels about what they do, or doesn't feel about what they do, that's not a concern to them. They know because I am called of God, and because God is watching over everything I do, I must do all things without murmurings and disputing. Can I tell you something? Whatever you cannot do without murmuring, don't do it. People might search for you and look for you. Where are you? Where are you? We'll be waiting for you. If you cannot do it without murmuring, don't do it. It brings condemnation. It brings judgment. It brings the heavy, heavy vengeance of God. When you're doing it and doing it, but you're murmuring and complaining and disputing, whatever you cannot do without, you know, fighting with somebody, without knocking somebody, without murmuring, disputing, just don't do it, just give it up. Because if we're going to be appreciated by God, recognized by God, must do all things without murmurings and Disputings. Look at verse 15. In verse 15, it says that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as light in the world. Look at verse 16. In verse 16, holding forth the watch of life. Don't murmur, don't grumble. You're a preacher. This is happening, that is happening. Don't preach then if you have to murmur because you're wasting your time. If you have to complain, if you have to grumble, if you have to dispute, if you have to fight in preaching, don't preach. Don't allow any murmuring, any complaining, and any disputing, and any debate, and any grumbling. Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. Amen. To serve the Lord with joy, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And whatever comes after that, you keep on rejoicing. I say unto you, rejoice. We're looking at number three here. Number three, we're looking at express your faith anywhere you are express your faith what do you believe how do you believe everything you believe express your faith with the enemies around express your faith with people on the opposite side they don't believe what you believe all the same in an excited manner explicit manner express your faith your 
faith with a life of noble truthfulness. A life of noble truthfulness. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. This is how you express your faith anywhere you are. There's no deception. There's no lie. What you believe is what you believe. And you express that. You express that with word. You express that with your action. You express that with the way you live so that we know you have an explicit and expressive faith. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 25, wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. If I tell a lie, what am I telling a lie? I fear the person I'm talking to. And if he hears the real truth from me, he might be angry at me. But if I tell a lie, God will be angry at me. But because I lift up the man, the woman, above God, I forget the anger of God, and I'm running away from the anger. And so I have to tell a lie to cover up who I am really. Ah, then I'm a hypocrite. But you've done something wrong. Even without their asking, you can tell them this is what I did wrong. But I've gone to pray and the Lord has forgiven me. It's left to them to believe or not to believe. But for you to go out and make it a lifestyle, a habit. Because you are always afraid what they will think of me, what they will say of me. And because of that, you live a lie all your life. It says, wherefore, put in a way line, speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. I tell him the truth. He says, what? You're like that? You did that? I'm sorry. And then he raised some acidic words on me. That's my fault. I did that. So I accept those acidic words. But you know what? He will forget. I will forget in five years' time, ten years' time. But... I'm living in a lie. And God records that in heaven until I have the courage to go back and tell him and tell her, you know what? I've been a big zero, a big hypocrite. I told you that lie to cover up. Now, please forgive me. Then my record here is clean and my record over there is clean. And forever. I live in freedom. You are living in a lie. You are living in, a, in bondage. And you don't know the next thing you will say that will contradict what you said before because you need another lie, a bigger lie to cover up a small lie. Express your faith. Express your truthfulness. And live the way a child of God ought to live. Not minding what they think of you. It says... Wherefore, put in a way line, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. In Ephesians chapter 6, reading from verse 14, Ephesians 6, verse 14, stand therefore, having your loins girt about of truth. And having on the breastplate of righteousness. Verse 15. In verse 15, and your feet showed with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In verse 16, it says, Above all, take the shield, taking the shield of faith, wherewith we shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. You can. I can. I can. I can. 
How many years have you been a Christian, a believer? How many years have you been coming to the Bible study every Monday here? And yet we find people coming, coming, coming. The fear, the attacks of the devil, the arrows of the devil. And they run from deeper to shallow, looking for deliverance. I about everything you've been hearing all these years, think about it. Who do I run to? If there's any attack, there's no attack, but if there were attack, affliction, who do I run to? Do I run from deeper life to shallow life to shallow assembly? Please pray for me, pray for me. Uh -uh. Look at this. Above all, take it yourself. Take the shield of faith where we, if ye shall be able, you'll be able. From today, you are able in Jesus' name. And it says that you will be able, able to quench all, how many? How many? All the furry darts of the wicked. Look at verse 17. And take the shield, the element of salvation, and the sword of the spirit we all the powers of darkness will be broken and destroyed in jesus name we've been looking here and there we've been looking there in that place and that place stop looking around look into the world your victory will be permanent in jesus name rise up now rise up and let us talk to the lord in prayer he wants us to have faith, the faith that overcomes, the faith that destroys the works of the devil. Explicit faith, expressive faith that you can say, I have faith. I don't have to talk too much. People will see in your life. They will see in your behavior. They will see in your action that you have faith, the faith that conquers Every time, open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. That's why we came, so that the Word can make a change in our lives. Evidential proof for saving faith in Christ. Let it be evident, known, observable that you have faith and let's see the proof of that faith there's no saving faith without appropriate fruit spiritual fruit if the fruit is not there, you don't have saving faith. The fruit of the Spirit, the love, the joy, the peace, the long suffering. That's the fruit. If you are saved, if you have believed on the Lord unto salvation, the fruit will be there. Gentleness will be there. It's aggressive spirit, living like a lion, wanting to pounce on other people. That's not gentleness. That doesn't show that you've met Christ and you've got saving faith, meekness, the pride that wants to lord each over all other people. Anybody can have pride. You don't have to have salvation to have pride, grace to have pride. You don't have to have faith to have pride. And the fruit of the Adamic nature. 
But when you come to Christ and you believe truly,